Hi everyone. Okay, it's time for us to start again. So what we're focusing on today is the story of the colonization by multicellular eukaryotes. So as far as time goes, we're now about 470 million years ago during what's known as the Ordovician. Write this down in your timeline, 470 million years ago. Okay. Up to this point, everything was sort of happening in the oceans and really nothing was going on on land until just now. So, last time we were at the Cambrian Explosion, then we had our first vertebrates. Now we're getting to our first land plants. Okay, so by the way, if you're ever asked in trivia or something else, who got to land first, it was the plants. Okay, followed by the jawed fish would evolve, and then the insects would evolve, and as you keep moving up the scale, you see how things are going. Because everything had been happening in the oceans up to this time, the land was really desolate and there wasn't a whole lot going on. The ocean was the happening place to be. But now it was time to move on to land. And so the earliest plants would be relatively simple and really nothing spectacular. It's not like all of a sudden a forest would just instantly appear. So evidence for the oldest land plants was approximately about 475 million years old. And it happened in the form of a spore. Okay, so think back long ago when we talked about how to put together trees and we were talking about monophyletic groups and all the other good stuff. I showed you guys how to put together a tree based on plants and I said seeds were relatively um, later evolutionary advancement because the earliest plants were produced by spores. Any of this ringing a bell? And isn't it great when the stuff all ties together? Okay. So those primitive plants reproduced by spores and the earliest evidence for a land plant was a spore. Now, just an interesting side note though, in some of that early evidence, there's some really cool stuff out there with, with regard to the fossil record and the fact that fungi also seem to be very prevalent in plants as well. So um, plants and fungi have this nice little mutualistic symbiotic relationship much of the time and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but even the earliest of land plants seem to have an association with fungi. Seriously, how cool is that? One little side note I forgot to mention on the last slide. Today, approximately between 80 and 90% of all green plants have some sort of mutualistic relationship with fungi. So in this day and age, fungi are still definitely in a nice little relationship with plants. Now with regards to where did land plants come from, it seems as if they came from a group of plants called the green algae, otherwise known as corales. Okay, so these guys are freshwater living algae and so these guys seem to be the ancestors. Now you might be asking yourself, why would a plant want to move out of water? And I would say, ah, that's an excellent question. Well, there's definitely a lot of reasons plant would, plants would want to go from water onto land, and we'll talk about those in the next slide. Now, there are potentially a lot of reasons that plants would want to go from living in water to living on land, okay? But probably the most um, parsimonious or the simplest explanation is light. They would have much easier access to light and of course we know plants photosynthesize. And so light levels are much higher on air than they, in, than they are in the water so that's definitely a good reason. Additionally, CO2, which remember that's what plants take in for photosynthesis, is much more easily extracted from air than it is from water. So two definite good reasons to potentially move um, to living on land. Now, as plants did make the transition from water to land, it wasn't easy and it didn't just happen overnight. Plants had a lot of issues that they had to face. And so let's say you spend your eternity, you know, up to this point living in water, all right? And then all of a sudden you actually have to shift to living on land. What are this pro some of the problems you might actually face? And I would say, oh, that's an excellent question. So first off, you have to make sure that you don't dry out. Okay, so life originated in water, and anything that lives on land these days basically carries our water with us. Okay, secondly, terrestrial water is fresh water, okay, whereas, you know, life originally rolls in salt water, so the salt balance is going to be completely off whether you go from one environment to the next, okay, and so plants have to deal with the fact that their salt balance going from salt water to land is also going to be a bit off. Additionally, gas exchange is going to be different now. Okay, so when you're in water, oxygen and CO2 are dissolved in the fluid, and so it gets pe picked up directly. However, on land, they have to find other ways to have gas exchange. So they really have to make sure that they don't lose all of their fluid because now they have to take the water with them. 
heat exchange is number four and that's a big one as well so water does absorb heat well okay whereas air does not so water acts like a buffer but air does not which is why there's such drastic temperature changes a lot of the time especially in michigan this time of year i think they said it was going to be 60 today they lied <laughs> Additionally, support. If you think about it and you're floating along in water, okay, you don't have to deal with gravity, but once you move to land, then you do. And so plants had to find a way to support themselves. Additionally, waste plants now had to get find a way to get rid of their waste, okay, and then the water could just float away. Couldn't do that anymore once they moved to land. And then last but not least, reproduction, okay, so in aquatic animals and plants, um, you can have some sort of... Um, male gametes that will swim but they're not able to do that anymore once you start moving to land and really get into drier areas so plants had to also deal with that too so all of these are considerations that um, plants had to face as they shifted from water life to land life now one of the first ways plants were able to deal with living on land is to have what's called a waxy cuticle so I don't know if you guys have ever sat outside recently or if you've had a plant and if you peel the leaf and you rip the leaf just right, you can often see this clear, what looks like waxy part of it on the very surface of it. That is the waxy cuticle. And the entire purpose of that is to help keep the plant from drying out. So to basically hold water in, okay? Now, plants still have to exchange gases, and this is where their stomata and their guard cells come in. So their second way to, to deal with this is to have guard cells which open and close, and stomata, which is the hole, and that's what allows for gas exchange between the plants and the environment. And this, of course, is what allows for them to photosynthesize because they have to pull CO2 in and then they have to get rid of their waste, which is oxygen, which we're quite fond of if you have to, if you think about it. Okay, everyone. So as we're building our plant, we talked about one way that plants keep water in, and that's through the waxy cuticle and the stomata. Roots also have many other structures that deal with moving things around, like water. Um, roots, of course, are pretty obvious, and they're a multi-purpose sort of structure. Roots are what help plants to stay upright, okay? And they also draw water and nutrients from the ground up to the rest of the plant, all right? And so the roots, you know, those are the main support, and those are what help to draw water in. The root hairs add more surface area, which allows plants to draw even more water and nutrients. And mycorrhizae, of course, are the fungi that they are famous for interacting with. And mycorrhizae help plants soak up nutrients by incorporating more surface area and um, uh, helping plants soak up those nutrients and that water. So the next part of the plant we're going to consider is the vascular tissue. So vascular tissue in plants is made up of two different parts, the xylem and the phloem. The xylem is what we have pictured here. So when you think of wood and you think of furniture, that's actually mostly xylem tissue. And what's interesting from a trivia perspective is that in order for xylem tissue to function, it has to be dead because the, xyl the uh, cells that make up the xylem tissue have to clear out. And xylem tissue acts like a bunch of straws. And then what happens is the roots will soak up the water and then they pull it through the xylem tissue and the xylem tissue distributes it to the rest of the plant. And so um, that way the plants are able to not wilt and have the water that they need to go through photosynthesis. The second part of vascular tissue is called phloem. Okay, and so what's interesting about phloem is that phloem cells are actually alive. And what they do is they take nutrients and um, minerals and so forth from other parts of the plants and then they distribute them around to where they need to be. So they kind of act like a shuttle service. Now phloem cells are very much alive and they have what are called companion cells that basically help tell them what to do. Now plants grow as we all know and so they will grow to be tall so they grow high and then they grow down into the ground and that's known as primary growth. Okay, and primary growth happens through what's called the apical meristem. Think of apical as in the very top or the very bottom. So the apical meristem is at the very top, and then the root apical meristem is at the very bottom. And that's what allows the plant to grow up and then to grow down into the ground as well. In addition to having plants grow tall and up into the sky as well as down into the ground, they also have what's called secondary growth. 
Secondary growth means they're growing in thickness, okay? So they're growing wider. My husband says I excel in this area. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> so secondary growth is controlled by what's called the vascular cambium, and it's a line of cells that produces xylem on the inside and then phloem towards the outside. Now, there's also what's known as cork cambium. That's another layer of cells towards the outside, and that's what produces the bark. You're not required to memorize this, but next time you guys look at a tree, think about all the cool things that are going on inside of them just to allow the tree to grow and survive. Now, plant cells metabolize food much the same way we do in a certain way. They have a metabolism, they take in certain products, they produce certain products that allow them to survive, and they also give off what's known as waste products, okay? So what's cool about plants, though, is they actually figured out a way once they move to land to incorporate the waste products into their cell walls. So all of the things that normally would have been bad for them, they then find a way to use to incorporate into the structure of the plant so they can survive and still grow and have everything work just fine. Okay guys, so think back to long, long ago when I first had you learning how to draw a tree, okay? So we had bryophytes, those are the non-vascular plants. So those are the mosses and they're really short because they don't have vascular tissue. We then have vascular plants, so those are like ferns and horsetails and all sorts of other good stuff. And then we have the group that's known as the spermatophytes. The spermatophytes reproduce by seeds, okay? Up to this point, they only use spores. And I'm not expecting you to, to memorize this tree, so don't look at it in panic, okay? Um, what I am wanting you to do, though, is look at the bottom left of this slide. If you look, that particular tree should look familiar because we've gone over it. And it also happens to ever so nicely show the relationships of land plants to one another. So as we go through this, we're going to be talking about each of these groups individually, and it will make much more sense. Um, yeah, that should be good. Now, as we talk about the plant group, plants do this amazing thing where they do what's called alternating their generations, alternation of generations. And what that means is they have a haploid stage of life and they have a diploid stage of life, okay? So in plants, the gametophyte stage, which is at the top of this diagram, is haploid. Now, I want you to think back to the biology you tried to forget a long, long time ago. Haploid means that that stage has one set of chromosomes, okay? Now, going to the bottom part of this, and by the way, the one set of chromosomes is represented by that small n in the upper left, okay? Now, the bottom part is represents the sporophyte stage in plants, which is the diploid stage. And this means this particular stage has two copies of each chromosome. Okay, so this is just alternation of generations. It's an evolutionary strategy. Okay, and it's necessary for plants that reproduce sexually because then they have a haploid stage where the chromosomes, they get one set from mom and one set from dad. Okay, they come together to form the diploid stage, and that way they have the proper number of chromosomes. Although... Plants are interesting, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. They have some exceptions to every rule. So let's actually put that alternation of generations um, and apply it. And so here we have a bryophyte. Remember, the bryophytes are the mosses, and this is their life cycle. And goodness, no, you don't have to memorize this, okay? But what I'm wanting you to get from this is that it has the sporophyte stage, which is on the left, okay? Now remember, that is diploid. Then what happens is that the sporangium will produce spores. The spores get released. Now spores, by the way, are haploid. And the spores will each grow into either a male uh, or female plant with, with regards to the mosses. Then those will actually produce their sperm, okay, as well as their eggs. And those come together to form an embryo. And then the embryo will grow into the mature sporophyte. Now once the egg and the sperm come together, by the way, then it's diploid. So that's the diploid stage of their life. And when it comes to mosses, you know, it's about a 50-50% of the time as far as how much is in the sporophyte stage and how much is in the gametophyte stage. And that'll become important later because more evolutionarily advanced plants don't necessarily do that same thing. Now let's talk about the vascular plants, okay, and we're going to use the ferns as an example. So remember, the mosses are really short because they don't have vascular tissue and they have to be able to distribute water all around. Vascular plants get to be much taller. Okay, and ferns are what we're going to use for this particular example. Now, ferns, think of the ferns that you will see soon growing outside. And did I mention I cannot wait until spring gets here? And the ferns are growing outside. Another place you can see some big, beautiful ferns these days would be in mire or the grocery stores. So mire and the grocery stores also have ferns. And the other thing I want you to notice when you go to the grocery stores is I want you to take a fern leaf and then gently flip it upside down 
so you can actually look underneath because that's where the spores are. And then with your family or friends that you might be shopping with, you can say, aha, look, we have spores growing under our fern and it's reproducing. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's, I don't get out much. <laughs> anyway, the ferns, what's interesting is that they tend to have, you know, once again, alternation of generations. And so, um, for their most part, they tend to spend most of their life as a diploid. Okay. And so the diploid part, that's the big, beautiful ferns that we tend to know and love and think about, but they do produce those spores. Okay. The spores will then grow up and they will begin to form their male and female plants as well. And then those will get together. Okay. To form a zygote. And that grows into that big, beautiful fern and the cycle starts all over again. Okay. Once again, you don't have to memorize this, but the bryophytes spend about, those are the mosses, spend about 50% of their life diploid and 50% of their life haploid. Ferns start to spend maybe three quarters of their life diploid and then much less of their li life as haploid. And that's a trend that's going to continue as we get more evolutionarily advanced. Now, the gemnosperms, those are the um, evergreens. So those tend to be the Christmas trees, okay? So we're talking spruce, we're talking fir, we're talking pines. Those are the gymnosperms. And they're called gymnosperms if you guys happen to be curious because the name means naked seed, which means they use seeds to reproduce, but they don't have a fruit over them the way angiosperms. Now, the angiosperms, by the way, is what we're going to talk about next. Now, when it comes to the gymnosperms, they also alternate in generations, okay? So they have a haploid phase and they have a diploid phase. So their sporophyte, which is the diploid phase, that's the big tall trees that we know and love today. And if you guys go outside, in fact, I'll give you an extra credit point. Take a picture of yourselves in front of a tree, okay, <laughs> somewhere and tell me what type of, is it an angiosperm, is it a gymnosperm, um, some sort of plant, okay, let's have some fun, you guys need some extra credit, it's been one of those weeks, <laughs> so I will post that today, okay, preferably a gymnosperm if you've got one, if not, I'll take whatever you got, okay, um, however, the gymnosperms, you should be able to see the cones, okay, so those are the female cones, and the big cones that are on the Christmas trees, that houses the seeds, okay, and believe it or not, though, um, gymnosperms also tend to have male cones, those are the small, tiny little, little cones that come out, and those tend to come out first, and so eventually when we start getting warmer weather, what happens is that the male cones will come out in the pine trees and they'll drop their pollen. And so when you go outside and you start sneezing and you notice your car is covered in this yellow dust, well, that's male pollen, okay? And so the reason gymnosperms do that is that they're hoping if they drop the male cone pollen that it will go and then fertilize a female cone in another tree. Um, depending upon the species, it could be the same tree. It just depends on the species of gymnosperm. However, that is the fe male and female part, okay, and that's the haploid life cycle or part of the life cycle. And then the rest of it that has all of the big tree that we know and love today, that's the diploid part. Now, angiosperms, those are the most evolutionarily... Um, they're the youngest evolutionarily invention, we'll say. And so angiosperms have flowers and they tend to have a partnership with insects where the insects will pollinate them. And then that helps the angiosperm because they get pollinated, but then generally the angiosperms provide the insects with some food. It's a really cool relationship. Now, what I want you to notice out of this is that once again, the diploid phase tends to be dominating in the plant, in the angiosperms, because we're more evolutionarily advanced. And the haploid phase, which is the male and female, the egg and the sperm, that tends to be on the right, and there's not a lot of it. Okay, so most of the life cycle within the angiosperm is spent in the diploid phase. And once again, you don't have to go through and memorize this. Just realize um, from this that the more evolutionarily advanced, the more time that the plant spends in the diploid phase and in angiosperms they happen to have flowers where the whole purpose is to attract pollinators so they can get pollinated and produce seeds. Now angiosperms, the other thing to remember is most of them also will produce fruit around the seed or I'm sorry, around the zygote um, to either help in dispersal or to protect it. Just a little side note that's interesting. So the purpose of this tree is just to kind of give you a nice overview and it should look familiar because we've talked about this before and we've had a similar tree that had a lot less detail. So having the presence of chlorophyll, that's at the very bottom. Okay, that's what differentiates plants from animals. Then we have our green algae. Okay, so that's what evolved. And then we have the presence of um, 
go moving to land and living on land. That's the next trait. Okay, so then our mosses and liver warts, though, we know that they did not have vascular tissue. Well, then vascular tissue evolved, and then we started to get into our ferns, into our lycopods, and our bryophytes, and then eventually we had the evolution of seeds. Oh, hopefully you guys are following this, um, following these traits. So seeds, then we had our seed plants, okay, and then eventually the presence of flowers, and that's what differentiated our gymnosperms from our angiosperms, is the presence of flowers. And again, you're not required to memorize this, it's just a nice way to kind of summarize everything and see where plant evolution is at. Now we've talked about this before, that it wasn't as if you just flipped a switch and forests appeared, okay? So um, plants, plants had to move to land gradually, just like everybody else, and some of the earliest were actually the simplest plants. The Rhiney Church is one of, in Scotland, is one of the most famous areas for fossils with regards to the plants, the earliest land plants, okay? And they're relatively simple fossils. The plants are not super complex, um, but they are pretty interesting. And so on the next slide, we'll talk about a couple of different, next couple of slides, we'll talk about a couple of different types that existed back then and what their names were. Now, the agalophyton was one of the earliest plants, and you can see the picture there in the middle, so as well as um, the top middle, as well as the upper right. So when you look at that, compare that to plants that we know and love today, what do you notice? There's a lot of differences. There are no leaves. These guys were really small. They don't have a well-developed root system. Definitely no seeds, okay? So they reproduced by spores back then. They were really short. So they probably had no vascular tissue. They didn't have a lot of roots, okay? They were really tiny. They did photosynthesize and they did live on land, but to start out, they were really simple and they had to be um, because they were among the first um, critters to actually move to land. Cooksonia was another plant that was existing way back then. And you can see that much like the um, Agalophyton, they were relatively simple. And the interesting thing about the Cooksonia is they never were able to find a fossil showing the bottom part of the plant or the roots or, you know, they wouldn't have been very sophisticated anyway. However, you know, they, they weren't able to find a complete fossil, but you can see they were still pretty interesting plants. You got to remember as things were moving to land, they were going to be kind of simple back in the day. So, you know, once again, they reproduced by spores. Okay. But they were a different species and, you know, things were starting to happen on land. Zostrophilophytes, this is the next group. And what I want you to realize is we're starting to get a little bit more evolutionarily advanced, okay? So if you look at these guys, they look a little bit more complex than what we've seen before. There's a hypothesis that they're actually related to plants that exist today called club moss, okay? And so um, we're starting to, you know, get a little more evolutionarily complex. And they might even potentially have a precursor to leaves. It looks like they had some scales, according to the fossil record. And those might eventually evolve into leaves, which is pretty interesting. So, you know, moving on up. The trimerophytes, this is the next group that would come about, and they start to be get even a little bit more evolutionarily advanced. And it definitely looks like this group had some primitive leaves. So as plants get taller, they start to have to have a better um, established root system as well. They start to have leaves, and that should make sense because as they're becoming larger, they have to have more capabilities for food to be able to um, meet all of the energy needs of the plants and so forth. So um, another group, and you know, they're pretty interesting, especially if you look at them. Okay, now things are starting to get interesting. So forests would come about um, during a time period known as the Carboniferous. And I can't wait to talk about the Carboniferous with insects because during this time period, that's when we had our dragonflies that had a three foot wingspan. We had spiders that, you know, were the size of your head, millipedes the size of a car. Have I mentioned how cool that next lecture is gonna be? Well, the trees were there as well, okay, during this time period. And so the trees would come about. What was interesting about the trees though is the branches looked more like a fern and then the wood looked more like a conifer, okay? So the Archaeopteris was a, you know, the trees that were existing back then, they weren't exactly what we have today, um, but they started to have the characteristics that we know and love of trees that exist today. The other thing you have to consider too is they would have had to have some sort of established root system. So because they were so tall, they'd have to be able to hold themselves up. Now the next group to come about are the progemnosperms. So it might be um, tempting to put these guys in the same group as the gemnosperms, but they're really not. 
they grew like the gymnosperms, they had wood like the gymnosperms, and they looked really, really cool. However, they did not produce seeds yet. Seeds were relatively new from an evolutionary perspective, and they wouldn't come about until later. However, they still had a lot of really awesome, amazing looking trees back in the day that photosynthesized and did all sorts of other interesting things. So the seed plants we know and love today, their seeds are completely what's called enveloped, okay? So they're completely covered. Early plants, though, their seeds were not. They were only partially covered. And this was just happened to be one of the steps along the evolutionary trajectory. However, by this time period now, as we're, you know, going on to the late Devonian, all right, so plants, seed plants were definitely starting to become more prominent and um, definitely more common in the fossil record. So seeds were here by this time, which was another way for plants to reproduce. Okay, so nigh of the time period is the Carboniferous. So we're talking 355 to 295 million years ago. And large parts of Europe and North America had swamp forests all over them. How cool is that? Um, along the continental margins. And this was a very warm and humid time for most of the continents. And there was a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere, a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. And the swamps looked pretty amazing. The reason the Carboniferous is so important to us is because this is where our coal comes from. Okay, so all of these trees, all of these giant insects that we'll be talking about next lecture, all of this, you know, um, foliage and so forth, eventually it would die off and it would get covered with, you know, dirt and that would get add some heat and pressure and that would turn into our coal. So that's why we call our coal a fossil fuel because it's made from fossils, okay, first of all. Um, and it's also, once you use it up, it's all gone because this, these, um, this material was formed, you know, 300 uh, million years ago and it's never going to happen again. Okay, at least not within our lifetime. So that's why we worry so much about running out of it. However, you know, the plant forests were established. There was a lot of growing, uh, growing periods. Um, in the coal swamps, they would have club moss trees and horsetail trees, lots of seed ferns, all sorts of interesting things were coming about. One important tree that is worth taking note of were the chordates. So, um, chordates, as they, as they were pronounced. And so these guys were interesting and they were related to gymnosperms, okay, which still exist today. They had relatively long ribbon-like leaves and some of the species basically formed kind of a mangrove forest while others grew in, in much drier places. So they had a pretty wide range that they could grow in too. But they were pretty interesting looking plants. Now the age of the swamp forests and the warm, um, humid days and giant insects would not last forever. And eventually times would dry out and that's when more of the gymnosperms and the conifers would appear. So gymnosperms again, naked seeded. Um, we tend to think of those like Christmas trees, but also you think of ginkgo trees and cycads and all sorts of other interesting plants. Um, you know, those are all fit into that group as well. And they came about most likely due to the drier conditions. So now we're at the Permian. Okay, and I'm sorry the slide came out a little bit wonky. Um, it was about late Permian was 255 million years ago, just to give you a time frame. Pangaea existed, things were much hotter and drier. Okay, and so this is why the gymnosperms and the conifers would really evolve because they were able to tolerate the drier conditions. So that gave them an edge over ferns that, if you know um, the habitat of ferns, they have to be kept pretty wet and moist, whereas the conifers can handle the drier conditions. So our conifers have the pine cones that we tend to think of, and they've got the female pine cones, which are the bigger ones, and the male cones, which are the smaller ones, and the smaller ones are the ones that shed the pollen, the female ones are the ones that hold the seeds. But the key is, is they don't need water for reproduction, so plants could start getting away from water, so they were actually able to survive those drier conditions, giving the gymnosperms an edge during this time. Now the angiosperms, these are the plants, the flowering plants that we tend to think of today, and they would come about approximately 125 million years ago. Um, in this day and age, they're one of the most successful groups of plants. They dominate the world flora. They have about 275 
hundred thousand between that and three hundred and twenty five thousand land plants goodness um, there's a lot of them <laughs> and these are also what provide us our very well-being our grains and vegetables and feed for our domestic animals so these guys play a big role in our lives but they were from an evolutionary perspective really um, they only came about relatively recently one hypothesized key to the success of angiosperms is their cooperation with insects um, for pollination. And so up to this point, in order for plants and gymnosperms, for example, to get pollinated, they dump a whole bunch of pollen, the wind picks it up and carries it off, and the plant basically hopes for the best. By using a little bit of strategy and actually attracting pollinators that go from one flower to the next to the next, carrying the pollen with it, um, the plants are providing food for the insects, either in the form of nectar or pollen, and as the insects go from one plant to the next, they take the pollen with them, excess of course, um, and that's what pollinates additional plants. And so this is probably why these guys have been so successful. This is also why we care about pollinators and bees so much because, you know, our very way of life depends on them. Um, we got to have that collaboration between the two. Now, of the angiosperms, it's hypothesized that, um, at least according to the DNA, uh, the earliest angiosperm species is Ambrella trichopoda, is, you know, one of the last remaining that was really um, old from an evolutionary perspective. And these days it's only found in an island in the South Pacific in New Caledonia. So not a whole lot of them, you know, but still existing, which is pretty cool. Once again, from an evolutionary perspective, things would dry out, the Eocene would happen, and this is when our grasses would come about, okay? And what's interesting about this is once the grasses evolved, um, so did the grazers, and so our horses and hippos, early hippos, um, deer and so forth, all of our grazers would come about during this time period, and they kind of evolved along with the grasses. And whether you realize it or not, not everybody can digest grasses. You've got to have a pretty tough stomach, Okay, and it's got to be able to actually handle things and break things down, and we don't have that capacity, whereas the grazers do. Okay, and you know, they came about as I like to think of it fashionably late, <laughs> but they're still successful today, so got to give them credit for that. All right, I'm actually going to stop lecture here. And we will pick up with the arthropods next time. There's a couple of videos, videos I want you guys to see. Um, and as usual, if you have any questions or if you need anything, please let me know. I will do my best to get lecture up on time next time. My apologies. I had a couple meetings this morning and things always take longer than they're supposed to. So I hope everything's going okay. Stay safe and I'll talk to you soon.